Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, happy Ramadan. My name is uh, Shuki El Hemo. I am the director of the Center for Maghreb Studies here at the ASU. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today a brilliant scholar and a great colleague. This is, uh, he's going to speak about the Maghreb before uh, the Maghreb. This is our last lecture uh, this year, but we will resume the lecture series in the fall. Uh, Jim O'Donnell is professor uh, in the School of Historical and uh, Philosoph Philosophical and Religious Studies and university librarian. He has degrees from Princeton and Yale and worked and taught in late antique studies in the classics departments of Bern Mauer, Cornell and Penn for many years before serving as provost at Georgetown from 2002 to 2012. He's a fellow of the Medieval Academy and served as president of the American Philological Association in 2003. His scholarly work has concentrated on the fourth through sixth centuries CE and, uh, um, uh, and, specific, and especially on Augustine of uh, Hippo. His uh, edition of uh, Augustine's Confessions in three volumes in, in 1992 is the standard work, which he followed with Augustine, a new biography in 2005. I have actually that book displayed right here. It's a great book and I highly recommend it. Since, since then, he has published The Ruin of the Roman Empire in 2008, Pagans 2015, and The War of Gaul 2019. His Avatars of the World 2008 studies the development of, te of the technologies of communication in Western cultures from ancient times to the rise of the internet. The biography is long, it will not uh, do him justice. So please visit, if you want more information, visit ASU website or the site for the, Mag the Center for Maghreb Studies.org. Um, Mary Jane, my colleague, my wonderful colleague, Mary Jane, Parmentier is, going, Parmentier is going to monitor the questions. And I also have uh, amazing, uh, there are two amazing people behind the scenes, uh, Rachel Banning and Salah Hamdoun. So, um, Professor O'Donnell, please go ahead. Well, thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Chuki, for embarrassing me into doing this. I serve on the advisory board of ASU Center for Maghreb Studies. And I always say in my cheeky way, well, of course, I know everything about the Maghreb because I work on Augustine. Uh, I've worked, uh, I've visited Algeria. I have, uh, I know everything about the ancient world. I don't quite know everything about the ancient world in Africa, uh, but close. So uh, Chuki comes along and says, so you should give us a lecture. Well, I feel very insecure about this. This is going to be an informal talk. But I hope I can be useful for those of you who are interested in uh, Maghreb studies and in that region of the world by talking from the point of view of an ancient historian who knows what was there before people ever began talking about any region as the Maghreb. Um, I will tell a few stories. I will have a few slides. Uh, we will look at the map a fair amount. And after a half an hour or so, I will throw up my hands in despair at being unable to say anything else and ask you to help us out by offering questions, comments, and suggestions, and especially connections between what I have to say and periods and parts of the world that you know, you know better. Um, I'm going to do a little Zoom technology with sharing my screen, and I'm a little bit of an amateur at this, so please uh, forgive me if there are some, uh, some glitches, but there we go. Um, here's where I would like to start. This is Google Maps version of what we call the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it's zoomed in so you can see the names of some of the subseas that I will talk about. But I want to begin with the provocative observation that nothing you see on this map existed in the reign of the Emperor Caesar Augustus. None of it. Okay, the rocks and the dirt and the water were mostly there and pretty much mostly in the same places they are now. But when we look at a map like this, we do so with the perspective of a modern who is used to geographically accurate maps. 
and the thinking about countries and spaces uh, in a first instant in terms of this kind of uh, a visual representation. There were very limited, very poor quality maps available of this kind in the ancient world. Very few of them and very few people ever saw them. Very few human beings could conceive that this was what their world <clears throat> looked like. When we try to recapture ancient perspectives on the world, I'll give you two examples from the sixth century of the Common Era. We get very different things. Procopius, the great Byzantine historian of the wars of Justinian has a description of what he calls Italy. But it's a description from the point of view of a Byzantine bureaucrat on board ship, entering the Adriatic Sea and making his way up the coast of Italy to Ravenna. And all of his description of Italy is experienced from that boat and from that perspective on that side of the, uh, of the peninsula. His near contemporary, Cosmos Indicoplustes by name, Cosmos who has sailed to the Indies, uh, wrote a book in the sixth century called Christian Topography in which he explains everything you need to know about the world. He's a rich source for cultural interconnections. His story, for example, of what happened when the Roman trader and the Persian trader showed up in Ceylon, Sri Lanka on the same day and had to convince the locals of who came from the more powerful empire uh, is well worth a detour. There were elephants involved. Uh, the Roman succeeded because he had shinier, newer coins showing the profile of his emperor. And those coins were what impressed the people that he was talking to. But Cosmos was also a little bit crazy uh, in a typical ancient way. Cosmos is the only person we know of who ever really took the idea of a flat earth seriously. And his manuscripts are illuminated to show you exactly how the flat earth works. Um, the earth is in the shape, you may not know this, of the temple at Jerusalem, which as he illustrates it looks rather like a very long, very tall Quonset hut of the kind that armies used in World War II and after. Um, a sort of long cylindrical domed uh, roof building uh, aligned from east to west. And he has the illustrations to prove that what happens every day is the sun rises in the east, runs along the roof of the temple, and then goes down and sets beyond the pillar of Hercules. When it sets, since the earth is flat, it needs then to run around behind the Alps to the north, come around to the east, and when it reaches the east again, then it comes up one more time and shines down on the earth in just the way God imagined. That's crazy. But if you try to imagine the world that way, you come closer to the lived experience of people in antiquity than we're able to do looking at a map like this. Now, I'm going to come back to the map in a bit, uh, but first I want to switch to my slides. I want you to observe the red push pin in the middle. That is in the town of Cosenza in Italy. And because we have the modern highways showing, you can see that the main highway running from Naples down to uh, Reggio Calabria still runs through Cosenza, even though Cosenza is well miles back from the Mediterranean coast of the Tyrrhenian Sea. And if you look closely, and I'll try to move my mouse here, this line is actually the ancient road from Cosenza down to the sea, bringing you down to the Ionian Sea on this side. Why am I interested in this space? Let me change my screen sharing view. Um, new share, here we go. Because I want to point to this place that was on the flyer for this, uh, for this talk. This is a view from the Ponte Mario Martire, it tells us, of the Bucento River in downtown Cosenza, Italy. Um, I choose it as a place to begin talking about the Maghreb before the Maghreb, because this is the river under which the Gothic king Alaric is buried. Alaric sacked Rome in 410 AD in an event that resembles nothing so much as the American 9-11 experience of 20 years ago. And then, having made his point, he made his way south through Italy, meaning to embark either for Sicily or for Africa. Uh, as he came down, he naturally had to come inland to Cosenza 
to make his way toward the water where he stopped at Cosenda because he had news that his ships had been burned or destroyed or somehow were not going to be available to him. He fell ill with the fever and while there in Cosenza, he passed away. In order to protect his grave, the story is that his followers diverted the course and blocked up the course of this river, buried Alaric in the riverbank, in the riverbed, and then let the river run through it again, protecting him for all time. So I like to use this place as a place to begin thinking about the center of the late antique world. Um, how you got from one place to another, why this was an important crossroads, and what that can tell us about how we think about, uh, about these parts of the world um, since then. Um, can I, I need now to change slides, and that means I need to change my own. Oops. Uh, ah, here we go. Um, this is a different view of Cosenza. Cosenza, of course, is right about here. In pulling this slide from Google Maps, I was consciously evoking the map that appears in Fernand Braudel's classic, The Mediterranean, in which he made a point of doing a map of the Mediterranean upside down, so that that tiny peninsula at the bottom, uh, that Eurasian peninsula that sticks out into the Atlantic, would not dominate your view, but you would remember to have your view dominated by the Sahara. Uh, very large, very hot, the winds blowing to the north, and therefore making the Mediterranean culture that we know and remember um, so visible uh, and effective to us. Uh, that's a way we don't even look at the world very often, but it's an important way to remember uh, just, just how provincial and parochial, uh, parochial Western Europe can be. So here I'm going to pause to tell a story about St. Paul uh, as a lesson story for the Mediterranean. This is a church of St. Paul in Malta, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, south of Cosenza. Uh, there are a lot of churches dedicated to St. Paul in Malta because in chapter 29 of the Acts of the Apostles from the year 59 Common Era, Paul was underway at sea to be taken to Rome to protest uh, for his freedom to the Roman emperor, as he had a right to do as a Roman citizen. And he was shipwrecked in Malta and spent the winter there for three months. It's important to remember that moment because being shipwrecked in Malta and spending the winter for three months is one of the most typical things that happened in the ancient Mediterranean world. The quality of seagoing craft was such the weather was such that the winter time was a, was a period when the Mediterranean was essentially closed to shipping. Um, even if you weren't shipwrecked, you knew to stay in port. And if you found yourself in port in Malta sometime late in the fall, you knew that you would be there for the winter months until the seas opened again. Uh, this is important politically and culturally for many reasons. Uh, one, for example, is that in the many centuries when Italy depended on African grain for food supply, the population of Italy knew to watch the weather and the sea carefully, hoping that the ships carrying the grain would arrive in the autumn season before uh, the sea closed, before it was impossible for those heavy laden ships to get to them again. If the ships didn't make it from Africa to, it, to Italy by about late November, there was going to be a lot of hunger in late November. So here I want to move to a map and I need to shrink your faces out of my way so that I can see it properly. <clears throat> this is a rough and ready map of the Mediterranean from a particular ancient perspective. If you look at that map, the places that are in lighter color and then the places a lighter blue and then the white are the zones from which land is visible if you are out on the water. And depending how well you know this region, you might want to look at it carefully. So look, for example, at the Aegean Sea in the east between Athens and Smyrna. With all the islands that fall in the Aegean Sea, you were almost never out of sight of land. It didn't take much navigation. It didn't take a very good boat to get from one island to another to another back and forth across the Aegean. Um, 
Elsewhere in the Mediterranean, you can see the brighter white close to shore, uh, and then the paler white, the light blue, further away. So look at the Adriatic Sea, for example. You're never out of sight of land on the Adriatic Sea. It's relatively, therefore, safe for navigation. You're never out of sight of land if you're traveling from Genoa to Marseille to Barcelona to Valencia and around to Malaga. Um, you're never out of sight if you detour from that route and go to the Balearic Islands. But now look at the darker blue. The darker blue are the places where in your ancient Mediterranean boat, uh, without a compass, uh, with nothing but the stars to guide you by, if the sky is clear, you couldn't know where you were. Uh, at best, you would know from the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun which way east and west were. If the stars were out at night, you had an idea which way north and south were, but that was what you had. That means those regions were more dangerous. They were less often followed and populated. Imagine Paul going from Israel to Malta and around to Rome. He undoubtedly went by way of Cyprus, by way of Crete, and then had to make the dangerous way across the Ionian Sea and was lucky that Malta caught him with that shipwreck where he could. From Malta forward up to Rome would be much safer, much easier to, uh, much easier to follow. If you look at the Mediterranean this way, and this is a Brodel le lesson again, you realize that it is not one sea, but it is numerous different seas with different conditions of existence. Um, I'm going to talk about these seas one at a time now for a few minutes um, and how they related to one another, because here's the principle that you need to, to follow. When you look at an, a map of the world, of the Mediterranean world, and want to think of it as an ancient civilization, you should not look at the land, you should look at the water. The water is the center of civilization. The water is communication. The water is transportation. The water is what binds human people together. The land, particularly around the Mediterranean, with mountain spines running down Italy, across between Spain and France, around northern Italy, separating from what are marked here as Austria, Switzerland, and France, all through the Balkans. Uh, the land was hard traveling, hard going. Roman roads eventually were immensely welcome because they made that land transport just a little bit easier, uh, a little less terrifying. The Romans built those, ro those roads not to advance commerce, but so their soldiers could walk from one place to another because soldiers don't transport very well by water. Grain and freight trans transport well by water. Individual human beings transport well by water. But if your army wishes to march from Gaul to, to Asia Minor, it needs to march by land on those Roman roads. It was a mighty achievement of the Romans that they were able to do that. And many of those roads follow the roots of modern freeways, so to speak, which is to say modern freeways found the same pathways useful when they were, uh, when they were being built. But the center of civilization is in the water. So where are the centers of civilization? Go back to the Aegean for a moment. Of course, the Aegean Sea well, let me say something else first. Um, before I talk about the seas in detail, uh, the other most important features of ancient societies were the rivers. But the Mediterranean is remarkable for its poor supply of rivers and riverine ports. The Nile, of course, is famous. Um, Israel, Palestine, Syria, Asia Minor, very poor on rivers. Greece, very poor on rivers. The Danube is well back from the Mediterranean. Uh, Dalmatia, uh, Croatia, Albania, very poor on rivers. Italy, really on the East Coast, only the Po River. There's no other serious river. There are very few even marginally qualified ports on that side. On the west side of Italy, uh, the Tiber is really the only river. North Africa does not do riverine ports. Spain has the Ebro, Gaul has the Rhone, and at that point you have run out of natural avenues of transportation inland for these, these communities. So your seas are what matter, but the dominant position of cities that can take control of a, uh, of a river 
uh, is undeniable. Eventually, Venice emerges in the Adriatic, Rome emerges in, uh, on Western Italy, uh, and they have long histories that connect their, their power over river and, and sea. Well, the Aegean I won't say much about except to say, of course, it is famous. Of course, uh, Athens and Sparta and Carthage, uh, and sorry, and Corinth fought it out for control uh, of the Greek literal there. And of course, uh, the Persian kings expanding their power all the way from Mesopotamia uh, at various periods dominated in Asia Minor. And what you can variously call the Greek Wars or the Persian Wars were fought back and forth across and around that Aegean Sea. Um, eventually, uh, and it took a very long time in 325 AD, uh, the Emperor Constantine declares that he will put his headquarters at what we now think of as Constantinople or Istanbul. And that had the effect of binding together Asia Minor, the Southern Balkans, and Greece in a center of a very long lasting civilization. When people ask me when the Roman Empire fell, I always say it was 1922 with the deposition of the last Sultan, because really the same enterprise had been doing business out of Constantinople, Istanbul for many centuries at that point, never mind the awkwardness of a hostile takeover in 1453, it really was the same civilization, the same society. Um, the division now of the Aegean between the nation states of Turkey and Greece, to my opinion, is a, uh, a fault for civilization. Uh, the Aegean really ought to be the heart of a community that surrounds it, but we can all think of reasons why that's impractical and impossible to think of in the 21st century. But move west, go to the Adriatic Sea. I've said a couple of things about the Adriatic. Um, it is not, as seas go, a very good sea. It does not have rivers other than the Po. It does not have ports. Um, it was for a very long time <clears throat> neglected by ancient civilization as a vehicle of cultural trans, uh, transportation or freight. It only becomes important when Roman emperors in the fifth century common era set their headquarters at Ravenna, halfway between Venice and the Po River, and then depend on the Adriatic as their communication for bureaucratic purposes, at least back and forth to Constantinople. It was quicker to go by ship from Ravenna down the Adriatic, uh, around past Crete and up in through the Aegean than it was to walk from Ravenna all the way to Constantinople. But that means that Northern Italy was powerful in that period because Gaul and Germany lay behind it. And those were the places the Roman emperors wanted to focus on, not anything south of the Apennines, not anything Italian. So move then down to the Ionian Sea, uh, the least well known by name. It's still called that on maps. <clears throat> it is the land of the, of the water land, so to speak, between what is the nation state of Greece, the heel and toe of the boot of Italy and the island of Sicily. This is quintessentially a Greek sea. Uh, the Greeks were never opposed across this sea the way they were by the Persians across the Aegean. An ancient Greek civilization made its way around uh, the heel and toe of the boot of Italy and especially to Sicily. Syracuse on the east coast of Sicily is vitally important to Greek civilization. And the siege of Syracuse in the Peloponnesian War was the decisive battle in that war, the point at which the Athenians lost their advantage uh, and the Spartans finally gained a permanent advantage. The Ionian can be difficult, uh, right about at the instep of the toe of the boot of Italy is Squillace, a place where um, a scholar statesman of the sixth century named Cassiodorus was born. Um, I've written my first book about him and my email address for Gmail is cassiodorus at gmail.com. Um, his hometown of Squillace is referred to in the Aeneid as Naui Fragum Squillaceum, shipwrecking Squillace. Uh, this was a vital communication link and at the same time a difficult communication link, uh, especially when traveling from east to west, because the winds in this region tend to rotate clockwise. Um, and so rowing and sailing from east to west at various seasons of the year was difficult and dangerous. Modern underwater archaeology confirms that a, quite a number of ships never made it uh, past Squillace, past the toe of Italy on their way to, to Sicily. 
but there are no rivers. Uh, there are no great ports. Um, many of you might be hard pressed to name a city anywhere on the instep of the boot of Italy or on that west coast of Greece, and that is forgivable. There are no great centers of civilization. Syracuse, Palermo, Messina in Sicily, uh, there you begin to get to a long and historically successful um, civilization time. <clears throat> Not so much for the ports, although Syracuse particularly has a good port, Palermo is pretty good, but because Sicily was a grain uh, barn for Italy and for the region and very quickly was settled, dominated and used well, first by the Carthaginians, then by the Romans uh, as a breadbasket uh, on which they could depend. But look now at the Tyrrhenian Sea. Uh, this is the one between Sicily, Italy, Corsica, Sardinia, and critically Carthage, modern Tunis. Uh, this is really the center of Mediterranean civilization from the time the Carthaginians settled there before the Romans were ever heard of and from the time when the Romans begin to throw their weight around. The Romans have weight to throw around in the Mediterranean for two main reasons. First, that region in which they find themselves is a central, easily navigated region. You can make your way from Carthage to Sicily to Italy to Corsica to Sardinia and back very easily. Uh, sailing in a clockwise direction is not a problem. You will always get to your goal. And there are great harbors there in Carthage, in Naples, for sure. Rome is interesting because the city of Rome is some miles, as you well know, away from the coast. Uh, Ostia, uh, the ancient port of Rome, is not a great port. But Rome is important initially because it is a land controlling power. If you wish to try to move from northern Italy to southern Italy on foot, you have to cross the Tiber River. And the city of Rome is located at the point closest to the Mediterranean at which the Tiber River can be crossed with technology of the eighth century before the common era. It became a trading post because it dominated that land trade route between Tuscany and Latium, which are in south of the Apennines, Italy, the two largest, most fertile, most easily civilized area. Rome took advantage of dominating that region by controlling that river and then set out to dominate the neighborhood of the Tyrrhenian Sea that it, uh, that it then controlled. Um, I started with the story of Cosenza and started with the story of Alaric because it is so quintessentially a story of this region. And my point in talking Maghreb before Maghreb, I'll talk a little bit about the later history now, is that there was no uh, confinement of the idea of a community on the south southern shore of the Mediterranean. Instead, if you look at the water, uh, if you look at the way human beings moved around, the natural communities of the central Mediterranean were defined by the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Ionian Sea. Um, I said Alaric was heading to Crotone probably uh, on the instep of the, he of the boot of Italy. Uh, to take ship so that he could follow the coast along and around Sicily, either to go to Sicily or to proceed eventually on to Africa. Um, as neighborhoods are created in the ancient world, that is the critical central neighborhood that explains the rise of Rome and the ability of Rome to dominate the Mediterranean. Um, I'm not going to go into greater detail, but we'll offer a comparison in a moment uh, but we'll just say that the story of the history of Rome can be told as a story of geopolitical influence extending itself first around the Western Mediterranean, then into the Eastern Mediterranean, and then into the lands beyond. Chance has a lot to do with the way these lands were shaped and the way people were able to take advantage of them. The parallel that I always like to make is with the situation in what we now call the Near East or the Middle East, Syria, as it appears on this map. Um, the most difficult place on the planet for civilization is the zone between the Mediterranean and Mesopotamia. The Mediterranean is the water in the middle of the lands. Mesopotamia is the land between the rivers. 
And when the divine intelligence was creating the geography of Eurasia, um, it put Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean too close together and too far apart. And the wars that have been fought for many centuries back and forth between forces from Egypt, Syria, Asia Minor versus forces from Mesopotamia and the Iranian plateau have a lot to do with the challenges of managing that space between. Uh, when in the seventh century of the common era, the two main forces, Rome and Persia, had sufficiently beaten each other senseless in a great war between Heraclius and Khosros, uh, that was the moment when an army from the south, an Arab army that had no one had taken seriously before that, found its opportunity to make its way north between the two great powers and establish an Arab power in that central region, which remains to this day. But that is why that power originally settled in Damascus, then moved to Baghdad, the Caliphate of Damascus, the Caliphate of Baghdad, um, and eventually settled into a world in which re a revived Byzantium uh, turned uh, the Arab Caliphate of Baghdad into the successor of the Persian Empire, and the old fault lines um, persist to this day. We have fought wars in our lifetime, back and forth, over exactly the same territory on which Greeks and Persians, Romans and Persians, uh, Romans, Arabs and Persians fought their battles many centuries ago. A similar kind of persistence uh, could have been expected of the community from Carthage to Rome to Sardinia to Naples to Sicily, but times changed. I'm gonna outline about three steps of that and then I will be through very soon. The first step was the creation of that Roman world that extended over, I'm gonna say essentially all of the territory you can see on this map. Even what is now modern Romania was part of the Roman Empire for a time. Um, and Roman power reached as far as it could into Africa until it ran out of the Sahara. It included Spain and Gaul, France. It included all of Asia Minor and what you see here as Syria, depending where the boundaries fell back and forth between uh, Rome and Persia. Um, and indeed it controlled Egypt and Egypt of the Nile up at least to the first cataract and diplomatic negotiations with people south of the first cataract um, as well. But it was not to persist. Um, several things happened. One of which is that the Roman government did an unsuccessful job of dealing with populations from the north. And at a point when the Roman government was insufficiently funded, insufficiently prosperous, peoples from the north were the solution they didn't know they were looking for. Uh, the so-called barbarian invasions, I like to think of them as refugee crises, began when people who lived outside the strictly Roman boundary found the idea of Roman civilization attractive and made their way across those boundaries uh, to make good Romans of themselves. The, the wars fought along those boundaries resemble very much the crises on the American Southwestern frontier in the last hundred years. Um, and the, the militarization and depacification of those boundaries was a great mistake in the, uh, in the fourth and fifth centuries of the common era. Um, I'm not going to go political and say, I think that what's going on now is a great mistake, but you might be able to draw your own, your own conclusions on our borders here. But eventually several communities of uh, people from the North, immigrants you can call them, found their way in the Roman empire that General Alaric became an official general of the Roman Empire. He made his way to Italy as a representative of the emperor. He fought the Romans and attacked the city of Rome, not because he was a barbarian seeking to overthrow civilization, but because he was a Roman general looking for a better deal for his people and a better place for them to live. Well, when Alaric died, um, his people left Italy and moved west into what is now Spain. Visigothic Spain, so-called, lasted until the eighth century of the Common Era. But in going to Spain, they were following another community whom we call the Vandals, who had crossed the Rhine River, come down through France in the first years of the 400s uh, Common Era, crossed into Italy at Roman in invitation, crossed into, sorry, into Africa at Roman invitation, and made their way across North Africa, eventually settling and sharing land for their people 
um, all the way from Mauritania, call it Algeria, to uh, Carthage, call it Tunisia. Um, because we have demonized the name of Vandals, we think of them as uncivilized. That is an injustice. Uh, they were a civilized people. And when, in fact, the Vandals took control of North Africa and instituted a tax revolt against the Roman Empire, North Africa enjoyed the most prosperous century it ever knew under ancient Greco-Roman civilization. But at the same time, that tax revolt meant they were no longer sending their grain at sub-market prices in great quantities north across the Mediterranean. And this proved to be the decisive point in the Roman Empire being unable to feed the troops it needed to feed in order to maintain the control that it needed to maintain to extend those boundaries as far as they had ever been. By the late 400s common era, the emperor in Constantinople is so frustrated that he invites another general uh, um, among the immigrant community, a general named Theodoric, to go to Italy and take control and pacify the country for himself. Theodoric does so. He takes control of Italy in 493 and remains himself uh, the undoubted ruler of Italy on behalf of the Roman Empire until 526. Um, if you took a different Roman history course from the one I teach, you would call that the Ostrogothic Kingdom. I call that the Roman Empire with a king who happened to be an Ostrogoth. Um, after his death, his descendants continued to rule in Italy into the 530s. Um, but Theodoric was, in fact, the longest reigning ruler in Italy for the Roman Empire since Caesar Augustus. Uh, his Italy was prosperous, safe, and successful. Uh, and he left a flourishing society for his descendants to inherit. But the challenges of a decentralized Roman Empire were too much for the Emperor Justinian in Constantinople to accept. And so in a series of highly misguided wars from the 530s forward, he sent his armies out, undermanned, undersupplied, to recapture Africa from the Vandals, Italy from the Ostrogoths, and he even had ideas of recapturing Spain from the Visigoths. He was marginally successful in establishing outposts in Africa and in Italy, temporary outposts in Spain. But the political unity of Italy that had been created by the Romans in the centuries before the Common Era was decisively fractured in this period, not to be recovered if Italian political unity has ever been recovered until the age of Garibaldi and Victor Emmanuel. Two important consequences emerge from this. One is that that triangle marked on this map of the Tyrrhenian Sea is no longer the center of a civilization of its own. Italy, as we see it as Italy, is too broken in pieces, too poor, uh, is not active over the water. Uh, Carthage, moreover, is held hostage by the Roman Byzantine forces. The only real Roman Byzantine forces in Italy were all the way in Ravenna, so there was no communication or trade between them. It means that this central unit, what I might try to call the Maghreb before the Maghreb, of Corsica, Sardinia, Italy, Sicily, and Tunisia, was broken, and the boundary between northern and southern Mediterranean created. Second important factor at the same time, the Franks in Gaul, uh, the local generals and officers who had taken control of Roman Gaul, were having their greatest success uh, of uh, of all history to that point. And the center of political activity in Western Europe was moving north into Gaul, looking at the Rhine and across the Rhine, looking at Britain and across the English Channel. The Western Middle Ages as we know them were being formed out of that political power of the Franks. Constantinople was a very long way away. And in between was this broken and battered territory of Italy and Tunisia. This meant that when the Arabs, opportunists again, as they had been opportunists between Rome and Persia in the seventh century, when the Arabs move west as a land power, not a sea power, their natural move is to take control of uh, Cyrene, which is Eastern Libya, uh, the land along the Gulf of Sidra, 
uh, the prosperous parts of Western Libya, Tripoli, uh, Leptis Magna, Oya, Sabratha, the Roman cities there. Of course, then Carthage, but then not setting forth on the water, they continued to move west uh, all the way to Tangier, into Spain, and all the way north through Spain, defining a new cultural community, first driven by the opportunity that Justinian had created for them by ruining what he had inherited, and second, by the newfangled practice of defining your community by religious community as well as ethnicity and language. The Arabs bringing their religion to this world were immensely successful as they had uh, every reason to be given the world they had been created. Uh, but out of that, they created the world that we now inherit in which when I think moderns look at the Mediterranean, we think that somehow the North shores and the South shores are different somehow or another that the Mediterranean is a line of land that divides us from one another. When in fact, uh, in ancient terms, it was the land that bound people together. Well, when I get here, I am beginning to pass beyond anything that I can pretend to know professionally and uh, with any and speak with any confidence. I'm coming into a world that I'm sure many of you in the audience know much better than I do. Um, I hope what I've been able to say has been provocative at least, uh, perhaps helpful. Uh, and I look forward to a conversation that we can now, uh, we can now begin. Juki, thank you again for this opportunity. Um, I will turn over to you and to uh, uh, Mary Jane, uh, the direction of what we do now. And thank you all. Thank you so much, to, uh, Professor O'Donnell. Now we move to the Q&A and, &A and uh, please write your questions in the chat room and uh, uh, Mary Jane will monitor them and read them uh, uh, to the audience and to uh, our guest speaker. Yeah, thank you, Shruti, and thank you so much, <clears throat> much, Jim. And if I, if I may, I might start off with a question and that'll give people a chance to write things in the chat and, and formulate. But um, this was just, I loved this. I love um, going back into history always. And as a sailor, I was really struck by your, your idea that the open ocean is, is more dangerous um, because with modern technology, we often feel the opposite, right? I've sailed out in the Atlantic and I've sailed in the Mediterranean and you know you stay away from the rocks and the shore, but we have navigation devices. The ancients did not in many cases. And so what, you know, what, looking at that map and the clusters of where you could um, you know, eyeball your way along, um, so interesting. And speaking of technology- well, if, I, if I could yeah. just say to that, Mary Jane, yeah. Uh, yeah. the historical effort required is to imagine what it was like to get in a little rowboat in Carthage and mm -hmm. paddle it over to Sicily and feel that that was high tech, amazing adventure, incredibly empowering uh, mm -hmm. for all your anxiety. It was nevertheless the, the way civilization got made. Um, right. And now we can look back and, uh, and feel sorry for them, but we should really look back and envy them the opportunity they had. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, so it makes me think of technology too. I mean, your whole talk. So, you know, how there was a lot about what you were saying that made me think anyway of human perceptions, geopolitical realities, but also human perceptions of those geopolitical realities, right? And, and of geography and how that's changed over time with our ability to um, transport ourselves across the land and the water, and then also to communicate and to see the land. So for instance, when you think of, you know, our area of study, the Maghreb, which means the West in Arabic, in fact, Morocco is called Maghreb, which means the West. So that's from the Arab, you know, heartland perspective. And it's considered sort of exotic. I remember being in Am Amman, Jordan and taxi driver saying to me, he noted something strange in the way I was speaking Arabic, strange to him. And I said, oh yes, I lived in Morocco. And he said, I've heard it's very mysterious there. So this was a perception. And then if you look at you know, the European perception through the, the Orientalism, right? The Oriental lens. And I guess you know, one question I would say is how do you see you know, mapping technology, communication technology, the way we can actually see the earth now um, having an impact on um, you know, perceptions of, of a region like the Maghreb or the whole Mediterranean, right? As a community or as a split? Because you mentioned how it was split, but it was actually a community oh. at one point. I'm, I'm really struck by the persistence of old and, and in many ways obsolete ways of thinking, early modern and modern ways of thinking 
Um, a quiz question I like to spring on my students that most of you will know the answer to is what was the first place on the planet that was ever called Europe? And the answer to that is uh, the European shore of the Bosporus uh, and, uh, and Constantinople. Uh, when you then come to a world in which a European community is arguing about whether to admit Turkey to the European Union, uh, there's at least some blindness to what other possibilities and other ways of imagining the world might have been. Even with something as inclusive as the European Union or meaning to be inclusive, there's an awful lot of looking to fortify what we already know and how we've already done things rather than look for opportunity to, uh, to restore community in a variety of ways. Um, I have flown Air Algerie from Paris to Algiers. Um, it's an easy flight. Um, the history there is toxic in many respects. And to my ancient perspective, France and Algeria should be talking to each other all the time. Uh, they live next door to each other. They should be family. Um, but we're a long way from getting back to a point, if we ever could, where they would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and I see Matt has, has thanked you for your heavy emphasis on the physical, marine, and terrestrial geography and playing a significant role in the evolution of that geopolitical um, uh, imagination and perception. Matt, did you want to unmute and ask something or say something? You don't have to. Forgive me, Mary Jane. I was just eating a banana chip just now. Forgive me, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that was phenomenal. I learned so much. Thank you, Jim. Um, but yeah, I always appreciate when, um, you know, not getting deterministic per se, but when we look at the physical constraints and impedances and look at, you know, um, ancient civilizations, excuse me, through the lens of the technological landscape uh, or the technological mm -hmm. tools with which they have to traverse landscapes. And of course, as you've heavily emphasized, perceived and sort of made sense of geographical space. Um, and, and the way you started this lecture, uh, really was about mental mapping, right? Uh, and, and sort of your taxonomy or systematic uh, perception of the way um, Italy was depicted uh, from the perspective of the Adriatic. And um, so, yeah, I always find that very helpful and I appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Matt. You articulated what I was thinking and couldn't articulate as well. I knew you could, Matt. <laughs> And there's a, there's a question here um, from Roger Anderson. I would be curious to your thoughts on applying Jared Diamond's thesis on the spread of civil, civilization from his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel to the history of this region of the world. Um, interesting. It's been a while since I've read uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. But I think um, I'm going to do a local example here for Arizona. And I apologize to those of you from around the country who don't know your Arizona geography. Um, the intervention of technologies congruent to the period in which they are used and in which they are dominant can distort the way human beings relate to each other over particular geographical landscapes. So my example is the Gadsden Purchase and its influence on the shape of the map of the United States in Arizona. Uh, to me, and probably to Matt Toro as a geographer looking at the North American continent if you said draw two boundaries, one sort of to get Northern people off by themselves, one to get middle people and one to get Southern people, you would not come anywhere near close to drawing the lines where they are drawn between the US and Canada and the US and Mexico. Um, and nowhere is this clearer than the Gadsden Purchase. For those of you who don't know it, this is the stretch of land south of Phoenix down to the Arizona-Mexico border that after the United States took control of uh, the, what is now the Western United States from Mexico after the Mexican War of 1844 to 1848, and so took control of Utah and parts of Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona. Big business came along and said, oh yes, the Gadsden Strip was like $12 million in 1850s money. Uh, big business came along to the Americans and said, uh, you know, you didn't quite get enough land. We want to build a railroad from New Orleans to El Paso to Los Angeles. And if we have to go north of the Gila River, that's going to be very expensive. So could you please go back and get us some more land? Uh, by that time, the president of Mexico was Santa Ana, uh, the famous demonized opponent of the Battle of the Alamo of the 1830s. And Santa Ana needed money. So in fact, a deal was cut. 
Uh, there's a very funny set of stories to this because when the war ended and the Americans took the territory, they did a bad job of surveying and they thought they had included the city of what is now El Paso on the east side of the Rio Grande there. Um, what is now Ciudad Juarez was El Paso del Norte until then. But in fact, they had messed up the surveying. And so part of the deal for the Gadsden Purchase had to be to get better quality surveyors out to decide where the boundaries were. And then draw these ridiculous straight lines in the land that we now, uh, we now inherit. Well, this is a political issue at this very moment, because as many of you may very well know, the line that was drawn by surveyors looking to draw the simplest east-west line they could draw goes directly through the land of the Tohono O'odham people um, who live on both sides of the U.S.-Mexican border. And when somebody else, I won't name names, comes along and decides they want to build a wall along that border, uh, they are disrupting a natural human community that has been there in a geographically sensible place for generations. Um, and imposing by force of technology, um, a different arrangement on that landscape. That kind of militarized technology is very often successful uh, and very often damaging the human community and the prospect of being able to engage with, with one another in a successful and peaceful fashion. Uh, you could say the same of the making of what I call the, uh, the Maghreb before the Maghreb. Uh, Rome versus Carthage was a war made possible by Carthaginian ship going technology uh, that brought together peoples who could have been neighbors facing each other across the water, but decided they had to fight a war with each other. And the history of the three Carthaginian wars of Rome is a history of the advancement of technology of both sea and land fighting. Um, and the natural result of that is someone winds up with a uh, with a dramatic advantage, and the Romans defeat the Carthaginians, destroy Carthage, and take their territory uh, as a result. <clears throat> and a different kind of community emerges. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And now there's a, a, another question here. Um, sure. Zainab al Bernusi thanks you for a fantastic presentation and says that you mentioned how the Mediterranean was a place of unity, not separation, and was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about where was secure or unsecure back then in the Mediterranean to reflect on differences with today since it's become a zone of conflict and insecurities, including those stemming from migration, which should be a natural component of the region. From roughly 60 BCE until, um, until the first Arab conquest, uh, the Mediterranean was safe. And I said 60 BCE because as Rome was expanding its domination through the Eastern Mediterranean, there came a point where it had broken existing civil authority in Greece, in Asia Minor, in the Levant, and in Egypt, <clears throat> and had not successfully replaced it. And so piracy, uh, there are two words always to be careful of in, in these periods, pirates and bandits. Um, another word for pirate and another word for bandit is capitalist. Whether that means capitalist is another word for pirate or bandit is another story. You can, you can argue about that. But there were people in ships attacking other people on land uh, and taking plunder and booty in the ancient Mediterranean, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, until Pompey the Great, the opponent of Julius Caesar, uh, made a successful venture east with Roman military technology, uh, defeated, destroyed the pirates, uh, captured, captured them and put them to death, um, and established peace in the ancient Mediterranean. Uh, from that point until, let's see, 455 Common Era, there no one perceived material, military, criminal danger from anything inside the Mediterranean. The Vandals in 455 did do their own sort of demonstration terror attack on Rome. Uh, and that was negative, of course. But then it was really the Roman Empire under Justinian that sent fleets west to attack and try to conquer, reconquer space for the Roman world that uh, they believed had been taken from them. They couldn't understand the evolving Mediterranean as a Roman, uh, as a Roman community. Um, after that, the boundary between uh, Arab-dominated southern coast of Mediterranean and north created hostility. 
<clears throat> and there we go forward to the moment in, in American history of the war against the Barbary pirates in the early 19th century, which was certainly construed in the American history books that I learned from as wicked bad people who lived on the south side of the Mediterranean not being nice to good people who lived on the north side of the Mediterranean. Of course, it's more complicated than that. Um, but de facto, from that point forward, from the, the pacification of the Barbary pirates, uh, the Mediterranean became safe again, with the exception of, of course, the invasions of World War II. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Zainab, I like your comment that, you know, it should, migration should be a natural component of the region, but it's actually, uh, you know, a source of, of conflict and a result of conflict. Um, well, let me do a commercial for a lecture that Shuki hosted a couple of years ago. Shuki. Uh, say the name of the scholar from Morocco who gave the talk about migration from through Morocco to Spain. Oh, yes, uh, Majid Hanoum. Uh, what I learned from that and why I like being part of the center is that the migrants coming through Morocco to Spain on his argument are not the poor, the downtrodden, the criminals, any of the stereotypes you get. Instead, what you see in South of the Sahel is families choosing the healthiest, strongest young man in the family to make his way north, get across into Spain, get across to some place, get a job, get a good job, and then bring the family after him. Uh, that is perfectly rational economic behavior on the part of the people who engage in it. We can be sad that people feel they need to do that. But um, that young man who crosses and brings over his brother and then his other younger brother and then his grandmother and his mother and father, uh, that man is advancing the cause of civilization as we have advanced the cause of civilization for, uh, for many centuries. Um, but again, we, we rich Westerners tend to militarize and policify um, these kind of events as somehow intrinsically undesirable and as something that can in principle be resisted and should be resisted and much human misery, unnecessary human misery to my taste, uh, results from that. Yeah, the sec uh, securitization <laughs> yeah, of human right. migration. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, let me say hi to my friend Kareem Bugida. From, uh, Kareem is from, um, wait a minute, Kareem, Constantine, is that where you're from? Yes, exactly. In Algeria, he's the university librarian at University of Rhode Island, and he's turned up. And to some extent, I was answering your question, Kareem, <laughs> uh, when I said what I said there, that um, uh, it's certainly a, a the there are people move across borders and across waters and 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 distances when physical and political situations make them do so, and turning that into a securitized, as Mary Jane would say, crisis. Uh, my judgment is historically, whether it's 700 BCE or today, only makes things worse. Yeah, Karim, did you want to expand on your question at all, or was that was that addressed? Yeah, I mean, I was just kind of, you know, um, trying to see whether like this refugee crisis was also the same. I, I agree with you, Jay. It's um, politicizing all those kind of invasion movement migrations. But I think I'm interested more. Um, it's more of um, Kind of the pre-capitalistic societies what's the impact on like really the movement and it's not really for religion's reasons i don't believe it's just spreading the good word there's like more economic reasons really no well, i think when religion and economic advantage reinforce each other um you get a particularly powerful force not always what we would say a force for the uh, a force for the good. Sure, the much later history of the Mediterranean is its repression as center of civilization when ocean going transport becomes possible and the world gets a whole lot bigger. And at that moment, the Mediterranean divided between um, East and West, North and South, Arab and Christian was at a disadvantage. The 15th, 16th, 17th centuries was a, an unfortunate time for the Mediterranean to be divided as it was and to be a source of local conflict when the rest of the world was there to be taken advantage of. Um, and others did, and the Mediterranean countries largely did not. And so our notion of uh, the Mediterranean as a relatively poorer zone of societies 
goes back to the bad luck of that conflict in that time. Thank you. So there's a question from Mike Turner about the linguistic landscape yeah. of North Africa in the century or so prior to the Arab conquest. Right. Um, I wish I had handy a good linguistic map of late antiquity. There are some. But roughly speaking, Greek had succeeded in making itself the language of the Southern Balkans, Asia Minor, and Egypt with an asterisk, and a dominant imperial language in Syria, Palestine, and beyond. Uh, the languages that remained strong in that part of the world were Syriac Aramaic in the zone from roughly Jerusalem north and east uh, into Mesopotamia, um, Egyptian, which became transmogrified into Coptic, and there's a good new book, I'm forgetting the author's name, about the making of Coptic as a language, a culture, a society, an alternative to, uh, to traditional Egypt. Uh, before the Arab conquest, North Africa, Spain, France, Italy, um, well, and modern so-called Yugoslavia were mainly Latin speaking, and indeed their Latin had begun long before to evolve into what we now think of as French, Italian, Spanish, and so forth. Latin was certainly the completely dominant language in North Africa, but there was still survivals of Punic in rural circumstances, and there's a lively modern scholarship about survival of Punic. Whether Berber of that period spoke anything distinctive is a matter of some controversy, but it was a small, um, a small community. I go that way by way of saying that it's remarkable in the, uh, the history of, um, and I see Roger Anderson's question coming. Um, it's remarkable in the history of this period that Greek remained dominant in Asia Minor and Greece shrank back completely from all the territories that the Arabs conquered, and Arabic essentially replaced Greek as the imperial language in those territories. And others know much better than I do the later history of uh, minority languages like Coptic, like Syriac, like Aramaic. Uh, there is still one town in Syria, uh, Malula, I've been there, where they say they still speak Aramaic, for example. And there must be a few people a few people doing that. Uh, North Africa, more complicated, but essentially Arabic supplants Latin. Uh, we do not hear of Punic later. Uh, we do hear a bit of, uh, uh, of Berber. And let me come back to that in just a moment. What's most interesting though, is that Spain, France, and Italy remain speaking Latin even when the so-called barbarian invasions could have brought a different language. But Latin as such does not reach into England and across the Rhine successfully. It's a, it's a spoken imperial language in the Middle Ages, but uh, the Germanic languages of England and across the Rhine do persist. And it's interesting that Latin goes away entirely in uh, the Balkans, in Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, and so forth. Uh, except for Albania, where a fraction of Latin is spoken to this day as Albanian. And there are loud arguments to this day, and they're very nationalistic arguments about how Romanian gets to be a Romance language, whether it is a persistence or a, or a, a re arrival of a Latinate language in that, um, in that space. Um, what's most interesting then to me is that Spain, as we now call it, uh, remains, it becomes a combined Arabic Spanish state and the conquest of the late Middle Ages succeeded in eradicating Arabic mostly uh, and supplanting with Latin, that is to say Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, these are some measure, but a very imprecise measure of the military and cultural success of the people holding the dominant language. And they're often quite local, uh, quite local moments. Uh, Roger Anderson, I'm seeing the question, uh, Mary Jane. 
Um, what I know about Berber is enough to convince me that I should not try to answer your question. I'd be glad to hear your perspective, though. Could I sneak in a little a little sure. historical question that's al aligned sure. a little bit with Roger? So I so when I lived in Morocco, I went to the um, the, 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 all the ruins I could go to when I, when I lived there and was interested in the history. And I had heard that um, they think that Berber might be related to ancient Phoenician because the Phoenicians they think had come out even around the Atlantic coast. Is there, is there more recent scholarship about that? I'm sure there's people that are studying Amazigh um, languages, but um, I'm not aware of the recent I, I'm, the, I'm the person who would not know that. Um, okay. It is the fact that the territory where Berber have lived in modern times was back country, not urbanized, and thought to be insurgent and difficult at various periods. But what association that has with given languages, I don't know and, and should not comment. Uh, Kareem, who's actually from there, was waving, waving his hand a second ago. Yeah, um, yeah, I've been reading this for, and even on my, my, ancestor, my ancestors are Berbers. Um, I think associating with the Phoenician or the, with the Punic or with the Latin or with the ancient Egyptian were all political games. So I think the most recent study is more like an independent language and it's, it's still lumped with the Afro-Asiatic languages because you know, like Arab historians were trying to link the Berber to Phoenician to justify the like the Arab invasion in the future. And we are really, really linked to the Semitic people. So we're the same, so it doesn't matter if you invade us. Or in fact, they're really totally an independent group. So, and the French were trying to do the same. Or we have some links to the Latin. And even now in Algeria and Morocco, they were trying even like to transcription, favoring Arab script. So we link the mindset to the Arabic culture and not the Berber. So there's a whole plethora of like political fight on that. Right. But it's totally, totally, I'm glad now we can talk about it really more openly mm -hmm. versus like 20 years ago was almost a taboo. And like the scholars, yes. many were like uh, a German, Moroccan, Tunisian, and French, and we were Germans and um, American too, they were like ostracized. Now like we can have like fresh look at it. Yeah, there, um, Jim, if I might, while we're on the um, Amazigh topic and in, in, in historical, um, you see Alexandra's question about uh, religion prior to the Arab conquest. And then related to that, Shuki has asked a question, how deep was Christianity among Amazigh people? Um. Probably not as deep as it might be for a particular reason. Um, again, having, having strong internecine warfare in your territory just before an imperial invader shows up is a bad idea generally uh, because it means you're not ready to resist. So in Roman North Africa in the 300s and 400s of the common era, there was a, everyone was Christian. Uh, and so the short answer, Alexander, to your question is, from, uh, from Syria all the way around to Spain, everyone was Christian. There were exceptions, there were local idiosyncrasies, there were places where what was called paganism survived, more in Syria than in other parts of the, of the West, but in Western Mediterranean, particularly uh, Africa and Spain, uh, Christianity had effectively supplanted other, all other religious traditions, but uh, starting in 305, 312, the Roman Christians in Africa had been at war with each other. A group who are called Donatists and a group who are variously called Caecilianists or because they won Catholics uh, were at each other's throats for a hundred and years and more over who was the true Christian, who was not. Uh, there was warfare, there was killing, there was terrorism. A uh, wonderful book by the Princeton historian Brent Shaw called Sacred Violence about the, uh, uh, about the wars of that time. Um, it is therefore argued, and there are traces of that donatism still there until the, 
late sixth century. So it is posited, we do not know this, that local resistance to Roman domination in politics and religion translated itself into a willingness to accept Arab conquest. And the very Christianity-like religion that Islam was in that period, uh, like in some ways, uh, was made possible because that culture had been divided. And the Berber and the other upcountry in ancient times, we speak of Numidians, people who live in Numidia, the highlands, uh, around a place like Madara and Constantine indeed, uh, Karim, uh, were thought to be less Romanized, more insurgent, and therefore more willing to talk to uh, invaders. Um, I will say that, and, and I accept uh, Matt Toro's uh, comments about the determinism. I will say that matching ideological expectations to physical features and trying to find an explanation that way is too common among historians. We have to resist that uh, in a variety of ways. Um, and Mike Turner, yeah, I don't know you, but that's interesting. That is interesting. And I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in just because of the religion questions while we're on that track. Um, so what about the strong um, Hebrew um, Jewish presence that I know at least existed in Morocco? And I know some of it was after um, the conquest of Spain by the more by the um, the Christians, but it goes back longer than that. I know there's communities in Morocco mm -hmm. where they they actually worship the same marabou. So so Muslims and Jews actually, you know, honored the same learned men and women and so forth. Um, um, Jewish, presence, presence, right? Jewish presence in Roman North Africa, very slight. And for that matter, Roman presence in Western Mauritania and Morocco, very slight. Uh, mm -hmm. So any survival is really of tiny communities and, and tiny, uh, what, uh, hermits, refugees, troublemakers who had, uh, had left Rome behind and found themselves over there. Uh, I know essentially nothing of the ancient history of the Straits of Gibraltar and communication back and forth across that. I'm sorry about that. Shuki has noted that we end at 1.15 and I'm sorry I got so wrapped up in this. It's so interesting. I would have just kept on going, um, but we have a minute left if there's a final question or if there's one that I might have missed in the chat. You have a merci, merci from Roger. <laughs> I don't know why French. <laughs> French. Maybe it should be shukran, shukran. It's the magra. Shukran, 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 bizarre. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, my dear esteemed colleague, for this wonderful uh, uh, conversation and lecture, and uh, uh, of, on the from different perspective. Because well, usually. Shuki. Yeah. Let me say thank you for making me think about this subject. <laughs> thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And so we will close this lecture. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.